Good morning. Cool, yeah, I'm gonna tell you a bit about retroactive public goods funding, what we've done in the last two years, what we've learned, what is coming next. Before we go there, fun, fun brief trip down memory lane. In 2018, I was kind of fascinated by this space. I wanted to find a place to contribute, to work in this space, and I found this weird event called ETH Berlin. It was wonderful. You paid $20, a $20 deposit to get in. You got it back when you were at the event. There were free snacks. People <laughs> didn't appreciate the free snacks, but I surely appreciated the free snacks. Um, and there were really fascinating talks. Uh, and through this, I found my way into the Ethereum community. I found somebody that would employ me. Uh, and so a big shout out to the Department of Decentralization, which is not only organizing East Berlin, but also Protocol Berg. So applause. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very stoked to be here today at the continuation of East Berlin. Okay, this public goods thing, you surely have heard about it. Um, this is a fun graphic from uh, a Vitalik blog post from two years ago. I think it was called, uh, The Scarcest Resource is Legitimacy. And what it's showing here is um, how much Bitcoin and Ethereum are spending on network security versus how much are we spending on R and D. Uh, some things have changed till then. We don't have proof of work anymore for Ethereum, but overall this ratio pretty much remains true. In the Ethereum protocol economics, there is nothing that actually dedicates some of the ETH or some of the revenue towards funding R&D, funding all the contributions that Ethereum relies on. So this was in 2021. 2021 bull market rolled around. We had all these transaction fees coming in. We had all these DeFi farmers, all these NFTs that we were trading, and we were like, oh my God, so much transaction revenue. What do we do with this? Then we were like, let's burn it, right? Let's give it back to ETH holders because then we have ultrasound money, right? It's even better than sound money. It decreases in supply. And since then, we've burned 3.6 million ETH. Um, so, so, so what did we do beforehand? All the revenue went to miners slash validators. Now we're saying some of the, so the revenue goes to ETH holders uh, and we introduce inflation for validators. And so what does this look like? This, this looks like a very capitalistic system. Um, we have the Museum of Capitalism right across, across the street. Maybe you want to check it out. Um, but so where we are today is we still have nothing in the Ethereum protocol economics itself um, that helps us fund the things that we rely on uh, in this network. It's not an easy problem to solve though. Every time we get into these discussions, uh, we discover that if we want to introduce something that supports the funding of contributions to Ethereum itself, we introduce this super opinionated way uh, to do this in the protocol. And this becomes a big attack vector um, and it makes the protocol super opinionated and we actually don't want this. So it's not, I think it's easy to complain about this, it's not easy to solve. So what are we gonna do? Layer twos to the rescue. This is one of the nice things around this roll-up centric future, this roll-up centric uh, present that we're in, which is uh, all these roll-ups, all these layer twos can experiment with how they do public goods funding. Uh, and I think this is not only us at Optimism, this should be a bunch more roll-ups, a bunch more layer twos that experiment with how can we sustainably fund contributions to this wonderful thing called Ethereum. This is the main reason, one of the main reasons Optimism exists. This is in our core DNA. Uh, our goal is not only to scale Ethereum, but to sustainably fund public goods. And this public goods funding problem is not only an Ethereum problem, uh, it is kind of a, a problem in the whole of cyberspace, right? If you think about it, we interact 
uh, online, on the web, we interact with this physical rule set that was made for the physical world. But cyberspace, with freely replicable information, relies much more on public goods, and we are not able to nurture the growth from these public goods. Our approach to this is retroactive public goods funding. Who here has read this article? A few hands, a few hands, nice. Um, we posted this around two years ago, and this outlines a core idea, which is it's easier to fund things based on how useful they've been in the past, rather than to agree on how useful they might be in the future. Um, if you think about proactive grants giving, it's really hard. Like, this is the job that VCs usually do, making bets about how successful or how useful something might be in the future. So it's much easier to do this retroactively and just agree on what was useful in the past. At the core of, of um, this public goods funding problem, I think, I think uh, this public goods are good meme is kind, of, is kind of funny. So public goods are good, but one, we're missing sustainable funding for them, especially in this place. Um, and even if we had this, we don't really know how to effectively allocate resources to nurture the growth of public goods. This is our approach to this at Optimism. This is kind of a counter proposal to like ultrasound money economics. Um, at Optimism, we have this beautiful OP block space. This is block space on OP mainnet. This is block space on other OP chains that are part of the super chain. So this is Base, this is Zora, this is the public goods network. If you've heard of these rollups that are part of Optimism, um, people use this block space. Sequencers generate revenue from this block space. Part of this sequencer revenue is dedicated towards public goods funding. And what we expect to happen if we fund public goods well is we see these public goods, these being educational resources, these being open source libraries, uh, all kinds of contributions, generating value to the users and builders within this network. And from this, we expect more demand for OP block space. And from this increase in demand, we have more sequencer revenue and we fund more public goods. Uh, and I think this is, this is like, if, if, we, if we were able to pull this off, this is like quite an exciting future. I think this is even more exciting than a decreasing ETH supply. Um, cool, so, so what are we doing with this retroactive funding? Why, why are we doing this? Really the idea behind this is to be an incentive machine. Um, what we want to do is incentivize the production of goods and services that the Optimism Collective finds useful. The idea here is if we retroactively reward contributions that are impactful, and we do this over and over again so it becomes insanely predictable, people will do things in expectation of receiving those, those rewards. And we will see more public goods being created and more contributors entering the space. This is not a new idea. Sounds like a really novel concept, not a new idea. Who here is using Spotify? Look at all of you not funding your artists well. Um, <laughs> if you're using Spotify, you're already part of this retroactive funding scheme. Right? Ignore, ignore Spotify, premium ads model for a moment, think only of subscription fees. Spotify measures how often a song is played, how often you're streaming a song, and then it retroactively pays the owners of the song based on the number of streams. And they do this constantly and they do this over and over again, so it becomes so predictable that you know if you create a banger of a song, you will, that receives a lot of streams, you will receive between X and Y amount of dollars. Not saying the system is working super well, we, we should fund our artists better, um, but this is an example of, of something you're already interacting with that is like a retroactive funding scheme. If you think of any repeated prize competitions, think of hackathon prizes, uh, think of yearly awards, 
um, they are kind of doing the same thing. They are rewarding past behavior. They do this over and over again so that if you're at a hackathon and you build a really great project, you have confidence in the judges, um, you can expect to win a hackathon prize and be rewarded. Um, and so what we're doing at Optimism is taking this pre-existing concept of retroactively rewarding the behavior we want to see uh, and just applying it to this whole ecosystem. And we're actually doing it. Right? So this is not like a novel concept. We're just mapping out. Um, we're running a bunch of rounds and a bunch of experiments to improve this system uh, and fund the public goods that we depend on. So in the first round that we did in uh, October 2021, we took a million dollars of sequencer revenue. Uh, we had 21 voters and they allocated this among 58 projects. This was a super manual process. It was all, it was all forms and spreadsheets. And we learned an interesting thing. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do in these rounds. We try to learn from these rounds. We try to iterate on our learnings and sh slowly but surely improve this thing to be a really reliable mechanism um, to reward public goods. We learned um, that we actually want to find a better definition for impact to the Optimism Collective. Uh, if you've been in the space of public goods funding, you uh, often get into this discussion of, um, of defining a public good, and then you look at this two by two matrix of like, is it a public good, is it a common good, is it a private good? And this discussion is actually not helpful to what you're trying to do. What we're actually trying to do is reward impact to the collective. Um, and the idea here is uh, we want to reward the impact that people created uh, and ensure that they re receive proportional profit for this impact. Uh, so even if you run a for-profit business, even if, let's say, you run uh, an educational resource and you have some ads, maybe the ads don't generate as much revenue as your educational resource is useful to the Optimism Collective. If that's the case, you should still receive those rewards to kind of equal, to, to kind of uh, take care of your impact and profit ratio. We took the learnings from round one. I think this was the most important one. We did another round around one and a half years later. This closed off in March uh, of this year. There, um, we dedicated 10 million OP tokens towards uh, rewarding contributions to the OP stack. We had 195 projects um, and 71 voters. And we learned a really interesting thing, which is we want to collect more data on impact and profit. We want to move away from something that feels very vibes-driven and gut-feeling of saying, ah, oh, I think this was useful in the past. And we want to become really, really good at measuring impact well. And this should also drive the predictability um, of what builders can, can expect in terms of their rewards. This is already impactful. Here are some of the, the lovely projects uh, you know and love. This is Crypto Zombies saying uh, this program allows them to retain their team and focus on building more courses. This is L2B doubling down on their mission. This is Ethereum Mexico putting up more events. Um, the biggest recipient of the last round, for instance, was Protocol Guild. Uh, I think Trent is next and is going to tell you all about it. Uh, we had. Uh, in, this, in this round, we had most of the Ethereum client teams, uh, we had Solidity, um, we had uh, Remix, we had a bunch of infrastructure that is not only core to Optimism, but it's really core to Ethereum overall. How do we know this thing is working? Right? We, could, we could send out all the rewards that we wanted to, uh, and maybe it doesn't change anything. Maybe people don't, don't change, maybe we don't see more public goods being created. What we want to understand is how does this drive behavior? How are people creating net new things? How are people uh, contributing more because they know these rewards are going to be allocated in the future? And we did a really simple thing, is we asked them, are you doing anything or did you do anything before round two with the expectation of receiving those rewards in the future. And we found out devastating things, which is people didn't. 
So 96% of the projects we asked said they didn't expect these rewards. Came as a complete surprise. Uh, and one person said yes, but they also said kind of like, oh yeah, I kind of thought maybe that was possible. Um, so we were like, shit. But then we asked people, are they doing anything now with the expectation of receiving those rewards in the future? Uh, and there, 45% of people said yes. So, so we're seeing kind of how this starts to kick in slowly but surely. Uh, and people are working on cool stuff. This is um, tutorials on Solidity and EtherStay-S. This is new crypto wallets. Um, this is revoke cash prioritizing features that they had on their backlog. And we're doing it again. So um, we're running round three. Um, we're doing the voting for this in November. And the sign up for this is actually going to go live next week. If I had to put a theme on this round that we're doing is we want to transition from something that feels very vibes driven where it's like kind of my gut feeling tells me how useful this thing has been to be more data driven. Uh, this is actually from, from Carl from Hypersearch put together this fun graphic. Um, and this is where we want to go. We want to move away from a really subjective uh, judgment and evaluation experience to something that feels very well measured and objective and is based on real world data. We're making a bunch of improvements based on the last round. Uh, so this is gathering the right data from projects, all the references to the things they've done. This is scaling the evaluation of projects. Hopefully we will be able to evaluate thousands, if not tens of thousands of projects uh, in a single round in the future. This is defining what impact means more closely. Better frameworks and definitions to help the voters in the system, but to also provide clarity for the projects. And this is fun voting applications. So to understand how scrappy we actually were last round is like voters had like a form with 195 projects with like an endless scroll they had to go down uh, to submit their votes. So now at this time we, we hope they will have a better experience. Um, when I say we, this is, this is not only the Optimism Foundation, this is a bunch of people working on this stuff, um, which is super exciting. If, if, you're, if you're excited about this, let me know. And the sign up is going live um, next week. If you've contributed to Ethereum, if you've run an impactful research project, uh, if you're maintaining a library that people use, if you're educating people, if you're running cool events such as Protocol Berg, you should sign up. Um, who here is kind of part of a project that received uh, rewards in the last round of Retro PGF? Whoa, okay, this, this is way more than I expected, but it's still too few hands. There should be more hands going up, so you should sign up because I expect you to all work on really interesting things that benefit the space overall. That's pretty much it. Build for the public good. Help us summon Ethers Phoenix. Stay optimistic. Here's my telegram if you want to reach me. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, we do have time for some questions. You're a very fast guy. Uh, so if there are any questions, then please uh, put your hand up and I will come to you with the mic. You have one? Yeah. Uh, super interesting stuff. Uh, I'm uh, curious about how you are dealing with the impact evaluation, how you handle that and uh, when I'm a little concerned about how we incentivize things, because when we we have strong incentives, maybe we can have some people, like some bad actors, just uh, pretending or simulating some sort of behavior just to get the rewards. And but if they are doing something good and impactful, maybe it's okay. I don't know. How do you handle that? Yes, that's a good. Um, that's a good question. So on the impact evaluation framework, in the last round we were like super loose. We just said to voters, like think about how important this thing is to this ecosystem. Um, how, 
what would this ecosystem look like if we didn't have this thing, kind of? We asked them like these broad generic questions. Uh, in the next round, we're defining this much more closely. So we're trying to split this up into like thought out categories and establish frameworks by which people can really go deep into evaluating specific projects. The idea here is you really wanna nurture the expertise of specific people in specific fields. Um, so the idea is if you're really knowledgeable on something, you should really spend time evaluating these projects and then share your findings with others. Do you have some sort of committee or it's open to anyone who has the OP token? Um, so the voters in the system are the optimism citizens. We're running a bicameral governance system. Didn't put this here just because it's always like a whole, you get into a whole nother rabbit hole. Um, but the idea here is optimism is not only governed by OP token holders, but it's also governed by the core users of uh, of this protocol, members of the collective, um, and they are tasked with allocating these retro PGF rewards. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Hi, how are you guys thinking about the network effects of how batch holders are selected? Particularly, are there thoughts as well of if batch holders decide that a batch holder that was selected by someone else is not capable or shouldn't be participating in the decision making, would the foundation get involved or how is this process thought out? Um, so currently um, what we're running with is pretty much the trust network in which existing batch holders introduce new batch holders to the system. So in the last round we had 71 people participating, this round we expect around 150. What we actually want to move to is criteria based election. Um, based on attestations. So the citizen's house decides on what are the criteria to become a batch holder. Um, and then whoever fulfills these criteria, whoever holds attestations that represent these, um, is automatically um, elected to be a batch holder. We essentially want to move away from something that feels like very much like you're electing a person or it's like a subjective process of picking people towards something that feels very very automated in terms of you fulfill these three criteria, you can participate in the system. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Austin, you had something? So as we move away from vibes-driven uh, selection, I feel like we might miss some stuff on the edge. And I think that, are, are you guys, I feel like vibes-driven actually did a really good job of finding like lots of cool long tail projects. Whereas as we move to more data-driven selection from the, the batch holders, we may miss some people down the tail that are really in need of funding and also uh, you know, not very visible. So I, I guess my question is, will there be a mix of data-driven and vibes? And my understanding is it probably will be, but yeah, it, it, can you talk about that a little bit more? Sure. So the process for this round um, will still be that batch holders ultimately decide themselves how to allocate these rewards. And what we're trying to do is empower projects to surface how they measure their impact and how they think about their contributions. So we want to give them the platform to show to voters what they have done and how they measure their success and their impact to exactly allow for this future where um, if you're doing something that is like not highly visible, but you have like really great things you can show for what you did, this should still like play a large role in the process. So it's still like a human in a loop system. We're not like going directly into just talking about metrics, but we're just trying to make this evaluation process a bit more guided and less subjective. All right, thank you very much, Jonas. We are out of time. Yes.